Good afternoon. My name is Tyler Sams. I'm the preacher for the Judson Road Church of Christ in Longview, Texas. Thanks for joining me today as we continue our series of studies on the person of Jesus. And today we're going to be looking at Luke chapter 4 in Jesus' synagogue sermon. And so if you've got your New Testament with you, open up with me to Luke chapter, Luke chapter 4. And we're going to be looking here at the synagogue sermon of Jesus. In Luke chapter 4, in beginning in verse 15, Luke writes and says, He began teaching in their synagogues and was praised by all. And he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up, and as was his custom, he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath and stood up to read. And the book of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him, or the scroll of the prophet Isaiah. And he opened the book or the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because he anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, he has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who were downtrodden, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. And he closed the book and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed upon him. The first thing I would have you note here is that Jesus is preaching from the prophet Isaiah. He has read from the Isaiah scroll. Uh, he has read from Isaiah chapter 61. And this, of course, we've said is a synagogue sermon taking place in a synagogue. And you might be asking, well, what was a synagogue? A synagogue was a Jewish community uh, worship center, for lack of a, a better term. It was a place where prayers and scripture readings were, were conducted weekly uh, here on the Sabbath as well as at other times as well. You weren't going into the temple in Jerusalem every single week. That was just impractical. And so really the synagogue kind of became the center of Jewish life in these communities that, that are spread all around the world at this time. So the fact that Jesus was invited to read indicates that at this point he was accepted in his community, right? He is coming back here to Nazareth, which, which was his hometown, and he is invited to read, right? You look there at, at verses 16 and 17. He stood up to read, and the book of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. And he opened the book and found the place where it was written. And then in verse 20, he closed the book, gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed on him. Jesus read, as we noted, from Isaiah 61, 1 through 2. And what's interesting and what's really going to shake the audience is that Jesus affirmed that the time that Isaiah foretold was being fulfilled on that day. Look at verse 21. Everyone in the synagogue is looking at him. He has just given this reading from Isaiah 61 verses 1 and 2, uh, a portion of the book that is decidedly messianic. That latter half of the book of Isaiah really does focus on the Messiah who was to come. And the Jews were aware of that. And Jesus reads from this section of Isaiah. He sits down and says, today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And the crowd was perplexed. Verse 22, all were speaking well of him and wondering at the gracious words which were falling from his lips. And they were saying, is this not Joseph's son? Is this not Joseph's son? What, what did the Jews know about the Messiah? He's described as a son of David. Perhaps they might have deduced that he would be the son of God. But this is Jesus. This is Joseph's kid, they say. How, how can he be the one that, Messiah, that, that Isaiah is talking about? In their minds... Jesus can't be the one to drive out the Romans. Jesus can't be the one to, to lead us to national problem. We know who this guy is. We've known him all of his life. He can't be what Isaiah's talked about. But that brings us to point number two, and that is Jesus anticipated his audience's reaction. There, there is perplexity 
And as we see a little bit later in this episode, it's perplex perplexity that's going to, to, to border on, on indignation. All right, look, look at verse 23. Jesus said to them, No doubt you will quote this proverb to me, Physician, heal yourself. Whatever we heard was done at Capernaum, do here in your hometown as well. Jesus has an idea of how his audience is going to respond. And again, in verse 24, he said, Truly I say to you, no prophet is welcome in his hometown. You jump back to Matthew chapter 2, this was his hometown. This is where Mary, jo Mary and Joseph returned to from Egypt. And this really is Jesus' hometown, the city of Nazareth. His hometown wanted him to do the wonderful works in it, which had been done elsewhere, specifically in Capernaum. But Jesus isn't going to operate just exactly how they think he should. And that's really going to be a problem. Jesus responded to their request by indicating that they should not doubt God's plan. Let's read verses 25 through 27. I say to you in truth, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah, when the sky was shut up for three years and six months, when a great famine came over all the land. And yet Elijah was sent to none of them, but only to Zarephath, in the land of Sidon, to a woman who was a widow. And there were many lepers in Israel at the time of Elisha the prophet, and none of them was cleansed, but only Naaman the Syrian. And all in the synagogue were filled with rage as they heard these things. Why? Why would they be in a rage? They knew of the wonderful things that Jesus had done in Capernaum. Jesus is basically saying, I'm not going to be doing much, if any, of that here. Perhaps that upset them. But perhaps there's something deeper here. You look at the widow of Zarephath, who was in the land of Sidon. You look at Naaman, who was a Syrian. Both of those people would have been what the Jews regarded as Gentiles. But Jesus is speaking favorably of them and using them as an example. And possibly even saying his ministry is going to reach out to these. Jews can't have that. And how dare someone speak well of the Gentiles here in a synagogue? And so in verse 28, all in the synagogue were filled with rage as they heard these things. And so his hometown turns on him. Earlier, as you look at verse 22, all were speaking well of him and wondering at the gracious words that were falling from his lips. They had given him the scroll to read from in the synagogue. But now, perhaps a few moments later, everyone in the synagogue was filled with rage as they heard these things. And not only that, verse 29, they rose up and cast him out of the city and led him to the brow of the hill on which their city had been built in order to throw him down off the cliff. The crowd was upset that the miracles were not done for them. The crowd was upset at Jesus' implication in his teaching regarding the Gentiles. His hometown has turned on him. What Jesus said in verse 24, no prophet is welcome in his hometown, Jesus experienced. And Jesus escapes certain death, though, by walking through their midst and traveling on to Capernaum. Look at verse 29. They brought him to the brow of the hill on which their city had been built in order to throw him off, down off the cliff. But passing through their midst, he went his way. What a description. This angry, vengeful mob, and what does Jesus do? He walks right through them and leaves town and goes to Capernaum. So how does this synagogue sermon help us understand who Jesus is? How can this help us as we strive to better understand our Savior. Well, first, Jesus' synagogue sermon applied Isaiah's prophecy to himself. Jesus took the words of Isaiah and said, I am the fulfillment of these words. 
And so we see Jesus as our liberator, Jesus as our healer, and Jesus as our redeemer. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who are downtrodden, and to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. Jesus is sharing the message that God intended a message of freedom, of healing, and redemption. Uh, secondly, Jesus' Jesus synagogue sermon prepared others for what was to come. That he was going to be revealed in unexpected ways, just like Elijah and Elisha and their work as prophets and involved some unexpected episodes. Jesus is saying the same thing for himself that in his work of ministry and, and in revealing himself as the prophet, there were going to be some, some unexpected things. And perhaps nothing more unexpected than how this prophet, the prophet, would give his life. Not in defeat, but give his life as a means to be victorious. Then I'd have you think about this as well. Jesus' synagogue sermon saw him rejected by his audience. And perhaps his audience would have done well to remember what Isaiah had written just a few chapters before that in Isaiah 53. In Isaiah 53, beginning in verse 1, Isaiah wrote and said, Who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. He has no form or comeliness, and when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. That's not to say that the Jews should have accepted anybody who was rejected. But remember, this was a miracle work. Jesus had done wonderful signs that they were aware of. And now they're rejecting him because he won't do them in their hometown. Now they're rejecting him because he's speaking positively about Gentiles. Perhaps they should have seen themselves in the pages of Isaiah and used what Isaiah wrote in Isaiah 53 to help them recognize Jesus. And hopefully we can too. Hopefully we can use what we've read in Scripture to help us understand who Jesus is, what he has done, and why he is so vitally important to our lives. Thanks for joining me today in this study of the life of Jesus. I'll see you next week.